Welcome back to Golf Today. One of the iconic moments in the game, Payne Stewart, 1999 U.S. Open, a year after a tough loss at Olympic Club, four-shot lead going into the final round. Payton would not be denied in the Sand Hills of North Carolina. Three clutch putts to close, including on the 72nd hole. Then, of course, later that fall, Ryder Cup, American comeback, his act of sportsmanship on that rowdy Sunday. Singles against Colin, Moore, uh, Colin Montgomery helped quiet that crowd at the country club outside of Boston. And Payne tragically died on October 25th, 1999. This week marks 25 years since his death. To remember and honor his legacy, we are joined by his longtime caddy, Mike Hicks. Mike, it's great to see you on this Wednesday. You started working for Payne, if I recall, in 1987. He already was a winner on the PGA Tour, but the press was, was tough on him about the fact that he hadn't won a major championship. What do you recall about your first meeting with Payne in those tough times? Well, uh, you know, I got to know Payne right when he came out. I, I started in 81. I think he started in 82. And um, his one of his first caddies was one of my closest friends. So I got to know Payne, you know, before I started caddying for him. Um, but the early years, you know, yeah, he had a hard time uh, closing the deal. And um, uh, thanks to Dr. Richard Coop, you know, rest, God rest his soul, um, you know, he, he gave pain direction and the mental toughness to, to learn how to close the deal. You were with Payne through three major championships, the PGA at Kemper Lakes and then the U.S. Opens at Hazeltine and Pinehurst number two. Obviously, the last one was the, the most iconic moment. I read, Mike, that you didn't even read a single putt for Payne that week at Pinehurst number two, that he was so much in his own bubble that he wasn't asking you to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I did not read a putt all week. He um, he was in the zone that week, guys. I mean, you hear that that's an old that's a cliche, but he was. Uh, you know, I didn't do a whole lot. I gave him the yardage. You know, there was very little wind that week, so you know, where's the wind? Uh, I think I pulled a couple of clubs. You know, and they were both on the tenth <laughs> hole with laying up. So I mean, he was just on autopilot. He was, uh, you know, in the zone. So. You know, he didn't get there very often, but when he did, it was, you know, it was fun to watch. It was such a surreal scene on that Sunday. It was a thick, foggy day, the church bells ringing in the distance, and, and Payne has 18 feet. Did you think he'd make it? Were you preparing for a playoff? What was going through your mind as you were waiting for him to hit that iconic putt? So the next day, I was doing a, a charity event at my home club, with Payne, Fred Couples, Paul Azinger, and Hal Sutton. So I had uh, Neil Lancaster on hold in case somebody, you know, in case that came up, somebody could make it. And I'm, I'm, I'm serious, guys. I was over there. I was going, you know, I'm going to have to call Neil and because um, I did not think he was going to make it. I mean, first of all, you got 18 feet up the hill. The green's got moisture in it. You can't hit it past, you know. Is he going to get that putt to the hole? I didn't think so. So that's what I was thinking, uh, honest to God. I was over there thinking I'm going to have to call Neil Lancaster and have him fill in for us tomorrow. It was only four months after that, Mike, of course, that Payne lost his life in that plane crash. Did, did the very public nature of, of Payne's passing make it more difficult for those who were close to him and who loved him to process what was happening? I think so. I mean, I think the, the fact that, you know, the the plane was on TV. I mean, I, you know, after I got word what was going on, I, I, I was at the, at the Champions Club walking the course. I was on the ninth hole when I got the call from Tracy. And, you know, I went back to the hotel and watched it on CNN, just like everybody else. And um, I think uh, the, the fact that, it, you know, that, that it was on TV, what was going on, and then, and then his, you know, celebration of life was also televised nationally. I mean, so it was... You know, it was a big deal. You know, he was a he was a flamboyant, big figure. I mean, uh, there's a lot of Payne Stewart fans out there. So, um, you know, the magnitude of his death, you know, and the fact that he had, you know, become a different person and given his life to the Lord. I mean, he was he was obviously, you know, a lot different guy. I mean, it was proof in '98 when he lost. You know, how gracious he was and how classy he was with taking that loss. 
Um, the the earlier Payne Stewart, you know, in the late 80s, 90s would have been bitter. And so, you know, he'd come a long way as a person. And um, yeah, it's a surreal moment, still surreal to this day. Mike, a lot of people loved his outfits and his personality. I loved his golf swing, the tempo, the rhythm, yeah. syrupy, liquid, languid. How would you describe just the beauty and how unique that, that move was in the game of golf? Well, you know, you, you really wouldn't teach that to anybody. I mean, he took the club back shut, you know, and then rerouted. So he had a loop in his swing. Um, but his father, you know, always, you know, there was his father told him, you know, never take that out. And, uh, you know, Chuck Cook was his teacher um, for a long time. And um, Chuck never took the loop out. And, you know, before Payne hit every shot, I, I would give him two, I would say two things to him. Get your spot, which was your intermediate target, which Dick Coop taught him to do. And then nice and slow, which was the key to his whole golf swing. You know, he had to take the club away slow. Um, if he got fast, then, you know, it could go anywhere. So those were the two things I would say to him before every shot, get your spot nice and slow. All these years later, Mike, from the 37 years ago that you started to work with Payne, is there any moment that still kind of makes you laugh all these years later? Well, uh, I would say, you know, some of the off-course stuff, yeah, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, um, tendon bar and... and in uh, Waterville, Ireland, you know, till the sun came up. That was a that was a night uh, that I'll always remember. You know, him behind the bar, you know, tending bar and giving drinks away. And you know, he'd been doing it for about a half hour. And I was watching him, and I, I called him over. I said, "Payne, you know, place is packed." I said, "Payne, you know, you, you realize you do have to charge these people for drinks, don't you?" And he kind of, you know, oh yeah, that's right, I do, don't I? So it was. Uh, there were some moments, all kinds of moments like that. Just uh, he was such a people person and, um, you know, still hard to believe that he's gone. Mike Payne left behind Tracy, but also two kids and Aaron and Chelsea, who've become these incredible adults, uh, you know, real life beings, as it were. What's it like for you to see them, you know, carrying on Payne's legacy in the way that they are? Yeah, you know, they, they launched his uh, apparel line at the U.S. Open this year, and, and Aaron is kind of the, the lead person on that. You know, he's the, he's the model, looks just like his dad. So, you know, what a better person to do it. Um, so I got to walk around in, at number two this year at the U.S. Open um, with both of them and their spouses, and uh, it was great. I mean, we had a lot of fun. I got to spend some time with Tracy. Hadn't seen her in a while. So, um, you know, it was a great week. Caught up on, you know, caught up, got to see them. And, um, you know, it was just a special week at Pinehurst this year. Is there anyone in the game these days who reminds you of him, Mike, in terms of the humor, the flash of style? Is there a modern day equivalent of a Payne Stewart out there on tour? Not that I've seen. Not, not, I, you know, that, honestly, I, I, I don't see it. You know, I mean, you know, Payne separated himself with the, with the, you know, the outfits and, you know, to go along with a big personality. It was a great mix, you know. Um, and, you know, you don't really, you don't really see most of the guys, most of these young kids, man, they're, you know, they're heads down, focused. You know, you got all this, you got all the stats, the percentages, you got all, it's a, just a totally different game now. That's one reason I got out of it. It's, it's a complicated game now if you're, if you're carrying a golf bag. What do you think Payne Stewart would be doing now? You know, I think he would probably still play a few on the champions. I think he'd maybe play the majors or whatever. Uh, you know, he would he would still play a little, I would think. Uh, I don't think it would be a full-time deal for him now. But um, it would have been fun if, you know, 42 had just gotten that Seymour. He'd, he'd gone from a good putter to a great putter with that Seymour. So it would have been fun the next few years, I think. Uh, in the major tournaments, you know, had he lived. It's so hard to believe, 25 years mm -hmm. since his passing. Mike, it's wonderful to see you, and thanks so much for reminiscing with us on this Wednesday. Okay, guys, thanks for having me.